Ready? Here we go. Different points of view and highs and lows. A new perspective everywhere you go. Open up your mind, drown out the noise, and see if this connected. And see if this connected. What's up, fam? The mission of this connected podcast is to connect generations and situations about faith, life, and whatever comes along the way. To not necessarily agree, but be listened to. These conversations, of course, highlight the perspective of our various guests, and you are always welcome to agree or even disagree. But as always, we hope that it is done in charity. Now, here's your host, Catholic.Dad. Thanks again, Tony, for that fabulous intro. You're the best, best producer ever. Um, not going to say that he's coming out of the closet because the closet is his studio to edit the podcast. But friends, fam, we have another episode on vocations. If you remember the last episode, if you listen, if you haven't, then you need to go back one episode to episode 101, which is Vocation 101 with Father Havu, the director of the vocations seminary, vocations in the Diocese of San Bernardino. So if you want to look that up, look in our um bio because there's a link there for the vocational department for the diocese of san bernardino just a shout out you know not trying to say that the diocese of san bernardino is the best but this is the diocese that i belong to so because of that it is the best oh man that humility is missing in that <laughs> sentence but anyways fab if you are watching this on youtube then you obviously are looking at the fact that there's somebody else sitting next to me and it's not Tony. No, fam, this is not Tony. I have here a friend of mine who I met several years ago, I think trying to plan for YCAST. If you want to look that up, then you need to go to SB Young Catholics in the Diocese of San Bernardino and you'll figure out what YCAST is. But I want to introduce to you a fellow youth minister, a worker in the vineyard, who I think no longer works as a youth minister, but he's going to tell you a little bit about that. But I want to introduce to you Chris Rodriguez, who was the youth minister at St. Francis of Assisi in La Quinta, not La Quinta, La Quinta in the low desert, who is here in Fontana with us, enjoying the fact that we are not 110 degrees and it's still hot. And he's like, it's great to be here. But I'm like, dude, and he says, you don't understand. It's 110 when I left. I'm like, wow. So someone who literally works in the desert every day. And I have him here because he has a reveal to share. And I'm excited because it's the first time on this podcast that we have a reveal. So Chris, welcome to the show. Please tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Arnel, for having me and um, having me here. Um, but yeah, my name is uh, Christopher Rodriguez, and I'm from uh, uh, the dirty desert of La Quinta, California, and low desert, woo I carry it. <laughs> um, and like Arnel said, I have been the youth minister and um, at St. Francis of Assisi in La Quinta for the past three years now. And so I'm just thankful and grateful to be here. But my reveal is, is that um, during this past year of COVID or year and a half of COVID, um, it's been such a blessing for me that um, God has led me to apply. And, and thankfully now I've been accepted as a new uh, diocesan seminary for the Diocese of San Bernardino. So yes. <laughs> I actually had a button for applause there, but I can't oh. figure it out. I didn't want to, I didn't want to ruin it, but, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I create my own sounds. But wow. So, so you got accepted and when do you start? I mean, it's like. I enter in on <clears throat> August 26th. So Thursday, August 26th at 3 p.m. <laughs> 3 p.m. Divine Mercy Hour. Exactly. So at the Divine Mercy Hour, 
the seminary and the diocese seminary opens and all the seminarians come back. Yes. You know, most people don't realize that, that they think, okay, they enter in the seminary and it's like cloistered nuns and they never come out again. And it's like you guys have summer breaks where you come home. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and get treated like the children that you are by your parents <laughs> yes. and have to do chores again. Yes. And and so August 26th, everybody goes back mm-hmm. and and you start seminary. Yes. So <clears throat> I've, I've always wanted to think about, you know, my thoughts were when I was young, that seminary, when you go in, when people go in, that you're on your knees, you pray in the morning, you pray at night and you go to bed. And it's like, it's all prayer, prayer, prayer. And it's literally uh, trying to make someone a holy monk. <laughs> but that's not true, right? No. So partially. Par- <laughs> so um, because I know because you're a youth minister mm-hmm. um, that you've discerned this for a very long time. Uh, we're going to talk about what is what is it that they do mm-hmm. in the seminary? You enter on the 26th. So what is it that you guys will be doing? there yeah so um as far as i know because we haven't had our orientation yet so i don't know all the answers um but i know for the basis you know that father Howe shared with me and you know some of the other seminarians have shared with me as well is is that you know we definitely um stick to praying the liturgy the hours in the morning the midday the afternoon evening prayer and and whatnot and i know there's uh times where we gather and pray together as well um, you know, for adoration in the chapel and also, um, but I, you know, and um, so that's, you know, a, a part of the prayer aspect. And of course, you know, a big part of why, you know, the seminary exists is to study and um, begin your formation towards priesthood. Um, and like for myself, you know, I'm going to be taking college classes, obviously. Um, and so it's just a big chunk of it is just formation. And the other part of it is also building uh, fraternity and building that brotherhood of friendship and, mm-hmm. and with your other fellow seminarians, your brother seminarians, um, and just learning how to live with each other and learning how to, um, you know, grow and accompany each other. And so, yeah, but I'm pretty sure there's a lot more that I don't know yet, but on August 26th, we have an orientation. So <laughs> I love that fact that, you know what, the first seminary was these 12 guys traveling with Jesus and he was the very first vocational director <laughs> being followed around by 12 seminarians, a.k.a. disciples, a.k.a. apostles. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I always envision is, gosh, you get to be there, you know, and every one of us are walking to become disciples. Mm-hmm. And every one of us are, but you're actually being formed yeah. to, to be, to be. And, and so how long did it take? Chris, how long did it take for you to finally say yes? Oh, geez. So for me, um, I the first inclination of towards this call of priesthood actually happened when I was in elementary school. Uh, my family was, uh, you know, practicing Catholic, and you know, we went to mass every you know Sunday for the most part, and um, and it. You know, I remember one time um, who my dad, he's uh, the usher coordinator for the mass that we would attend. And he and he, um, you know, would ask me as a, you know, like a first or second grader, um, you know, can you help take up the basket to the altar? And I remember, um, you know, taking up the basket and he didn't tell me that I had to go to, off to the side or, you know, come back to my pew. He just told me to take it up. And so me being a first second, I didn't know what to do. So they took the basket, the altar server, and I just stood there and watched the priests at the very, you know, <laughs> the, the front of the church. And I was just like, oh. <laughs> and then it wasn't until another usher came up and said, come on, let's go. <laughs> and I said, oh. And But I just remember in that, like, 20 seconds of me just standing there in awkwardness and just standing there and seeing the priest prepare um, the altar. And it, I don't know, it was just something so beautiful that I didn't know how to process it in that moment. But I knew that it was something that I wanted to see again and again and again. Like every time I saw a priest, like I always get like, oh, like I I saw them as a superhero, especially like Mm -hmm. as a little kid. And so and then, you know, I I continued helping as an usher with my parents. Um, And then middle school, like, you know, I attended middle school youth group from sixth grade um, through, you know, through middle school, high school. And, um, you know, the 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 inclination or the, the the interest was still there about the priesthood, but I didn't really know how to act on it, to be honest with you. And it wasn't until really um, my senior year of high school 
um, when I attended a Steubenville conference um, in San Diego. And it wasn't until, um, you know, just a whole bunch of thoughts of being a, a recently graduated senior in high school and just wondering like, what am I gonna do with my life and, and just everything. And it was just kind of a lot like, you know, I didn't, I didn't have a plan, you know, I thought I wanted to go into college as, you know, at certain major, but it, you know, the, obviously wasn't the call that was right for me. And so after that Steubenville experience and just experiencing adoration and the blessed sacrament for, you know, that, that one, Honestly, that was probably the first time that I've ever been exposed to that um, at Steubenville and just, you know, just feeling God's presence and his love and his just mercy in that moment just really transformed me. And, and that's when it became more prevalent to thinking about, you know, becoming a priest. And honestly, and, you know, all my friends, uh, my close friends back at home, they know that I fought this, that even though I had that desire I fought this for many years. I said, no, I said, priestess is it, is it for me. You know, I, I, I desire marriage and, and family and, and kids. And, you know, I, I desire family life. And it wasn't until, um, you know, I've struggled with that for the past three years of really discerning if God is calling me and, and everything. And it wasn't until actually COVID hit. Um, and mm -hmm. actually I was uh, furloughed like many youth ministers in the diocese um, because, um, you know, financial reasons and, you know, different realities for different parishes. But the reality was our parish is that most of our staff was furloughed um, due to the closures. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't until uh, May of 20 or no, April of 2020 was when I really, you know, was kind of forced to take time and I you know there was no ministry or nothing that I could do legally because you can't volunteer for your own yeah. work ministry or do the California labor laws but um you know it wasn't until then that I in the silence and in the isolation and the quarantine that really made me reflect and discern and pray and and, and truthfully pray, not just, you know, you know, God take this away from me or, you know, please just, just get over with it, but really like intently pray, like, okay, God, like, are you really calling me to this? Mm -hmm. And it got to a point where, you know, I would get out of my house and go to, you know, a mount, uh, uh, up a highway that we have, and I would just sit there in nature. And I just, you know, I remember just praying one day and I said, well, what's the worst that can happen if I, you know, uh, if I just take that step forward and it got to a point where I said, okay, I said, well, let me, let me, let's do it. You know, I said, okay, Lord, like, I trust you. Like if it's, if it's truly of your will, then it's truly of your will and everything will fall into place. Everything, you know, um, you know, obviously the, there was, there was a lot of struggles this past year too, but I mean, you know, if it's truly for you, for you calling me to the priesthood, then, um, then it'll be okay. And I have nothing to worry about because I wow. place my trust into you. I surrender to you. You, okay, let's, let's do this, God. And so, um, and then, so that was in April. And then in May, um, I contacted Father Hal and we had a um, interview over the phone and he called me and we talked <clears throat> and um, uh, a, a week later I was sent the application and that's when it really hit like, oh, okay. <laughs> like it's here <laughs> and so yeah so it wasn't until COVID that that yes really became prevalent and here so all that time while the Lord and the Holy Spirit were pursuing you mm -hmm. you kept saying no mm -hmm. you were trying to find reasons mm -hmm. uh, to fill that hole mm -hmm. with something and, and trying to find an alternative vocation yes which led you to youth ministry, mm -hmm. which <clears throat> I know some of the people that you walk with, your desert crew, mm -hmm. shout out to Maritza. <laughs> yeah, just want to say really classic person there. I know that she's a really close friend when, when yes. they talk highly about you. Mm -hmm. uh, I always say best friends are people who can roast you and you can laugh about it. Mm -hmm. But um, I saw that friendship and that you, you, you have this group of people that you're leading, mm -hmm. that you're walking with. Um, so how long were you in ministry? So I became a leader as a volunteer. Uh, I became a junior leader in seventh grade. And every, up until, I mean, I was, I've been a leader ever since. Uh, it wasn't until 2018 when I was offered a position actually at a sister parish in the Valley at St. Louis um, Catholic Church in Cathedral City. 
And um, so professionally, I've been a minister for about four years now or three years now. And, um, and as a volunteer since, I guess that would maybe like seven years, eight wow. years. So yeah, so ever since seventh grade, so yeah. Good deal. How old are you? I'm 23. 23. So did you go to college immediately after high school? So yes. So I, I went to a community college, um, Santa Monica College in Santa Monica, California. Um, That's where it is. Yes. <laughs> and um, I actually went in as a, as a nursing major. So <laughs> yes, love the nurses, Filipinos. <laughs> yes. Nurses. Yes. <laughs> and, and so then you went back to yes. the desert. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what a wonderful story that, you know, you, you, you chose to serve. Now, I always like to ask this question. When did you tell your mom and dad that, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm going into the Tiber. Mm-hmm. I'm going head deep into this. And I've said yes. Yeah. So I actually didn't tell my parents right away. I waited until um, uh, December, December 11th. Wait until Maritza, you know, blew it. <laughs> I'm just no, kidding. She almost did. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Love you, Maritza. <laughs> um, but I actually didn't tell him until December 11th, 2020. Um, so um, the day before our, our, lady of Guadalupe. our lady of Guadalupe, which is actually my baptismal day. Wow. Yeah. And so I didn't know that. Well, so that gave I, me goosebumps. I know. It, it. When I found out after, I mean, I never knew the exact date of my baptism for, I always speculated because my parents never showed me my baptism certificate, but, you know. And so when I found out it was the, actually on the day of our, the feast day of Our Lady, I was shocked and what a beautiful and yeah, yeah. But I actually didn't tell him until um, you know halfway through the just you know the year application process. So um, and so yeah. And what did they say? They were they weren't shocked. Um, I have a feeling that my mom knew was something was coming um, and she even, you know, told me after the fact, like, you know, after my dad stepped away too, I mean, both of my parents were very overjoyed and, and happy, but like, you know, I have a special connection with uh, my mom and, you know, I have different special connection with my dad in a certain way and special connection with my mom in a certain way. And so when it was just me and my mom one-on-one, she was just like, you know, I, I she told me that she had an inclination, like, mm-hmm. you know, sooner than, you know, than what it went. Moms always know. Oh yeah, yeah, but um, but yeah. So she, she, I feel like she knew, you know, for the past few years, and especially you know, because she knows that I practically lived at the church, you know, <laughs> as a volunteer and as a minister. Um, so it was just something that was so you know profound, and my parents are a hundred percent supportive, over the moon, and so is the rest of my family too, and friends. And, yeah. Awesome. Do you have any other siblings? I have two older brothers. Yeah. So one, my oldest one is uh, my oldest brother is. Uh, 34 and my second oldest brother is uh 28 yes and how do they feel about it um so my older my oldest brother he's not a practicing catholic or you know my second oldest brother isn't a practicing catholic either um but um uh you know they're supportive of me you know um definitely with my second oldest brother he was kind of um he, he would just ask a lot of questions which you know it's just which is good you know I, but he's very supportive and you know trying to understand where I'm coming from with yeah. a lot of different things so but overall they're they're very supportive of it. Yeah. yeah if I was that older brother and I kind of think I would I, I'd be like that older brother and I would say and the question an older brother would say um because this is this connected podcast and I'm sorry Tony I, you're not here to like tell me don't so I'm gonna ask it's like as an older brother, your older brother probably would ask, dude, um, so no sex? <laughs> it's like, it's like you're going to be able to live your life yeah. without sex? Yeah. It's like, did he, you know, are those thoughts? Yeah. Those thoughts and he always probably had that. He probably had that question too, but it was more so like, are you, is this really what you want to do? And I'm just like, yeah, <laughs> like, like not, not necessarily. I mean, yes. Cause I have the desire to, you know, the God given desire, but also because, you know, God has called me to it. And I, I can't say no, you know? Yeah. And so, yeah. So he was just asking questions like more like, well, if you're passionate about it, then yeah, yeah. you know, supportive and go for it, you know, hundred percent. But yeah. <laughs> it's interesting because a lot of times um, we have many people in, in, in our communities in our parish who pray for vocations. Mm-hmm. And I always like to think when I'm watching parents pray for vocations is, is this is what their prayer sounds like. Lord, let there increase vocations and then it's kind of like in exodus and they're saying 
let this pass by my child. <laughs> Find another child that will become a priest. Please, not mine. <laughs> like, and and as, as a parent, you know, I don't think I would be far off from, from feeling like that, especially when you have, uh, you know, in, in a Hispanic community where you have your sons and they're going to leave you. And then with in a Hispanic community where, you, you know, Hispanic moms, it's like sons don't leave moms. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you know, she's going off. Yeah. But also in, in, in a Filipino household and in Hispanic households, when you have a priest in the family, it's almost like a badge of honor. Um, and it, it's an excitement that, that says, yes, Lord, I've offered you our fruit. Yes. You, know, you know, first fruits of our labor, we offer the best fruit of, of us, we offer to you. And, and I just have to say to your parents, thank you for your, your, your yes and, and raising Chris to be able to say yes, to be one of our holy priests to guide our future and our present young people. And so that's why I'm so excited. That's why I have you here. Because one of the things um, that I always growing up was I grew up with a lot of missionary priests Mm -hmm. from other countries and nothing against our missionary priests. Mm -hmm. And I love you, all each and every one of you. I do, especially Father Suresh. Love you, brother. Um, But one of the things that, that I always had issues growing up was in a way, they couldn't relate to the way I was growing up mm-hmm. in this country. Mm-hmm. And they gave me great um, spiritual guidance in the faith. But what I was going through here in America mm-hmm. was a little bit different. But when I met priests who did grow up here, I'm like, dude, you're easy to talk to. Mm-hmm. I was like, I can literally call you dude. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I think there's an importance in that aspect, and especially having younger priests come in to speak to our younger people, they can relate. Uh, relational ministry is, is, is super important, as you know, in, in youth ministry is being able to relate to the individual. Uh, there'll be, I think, you know, I'm rambling because I think what I'm trying to say is this is an amazing time when we have young men like you who come say yes and because you served in ministry, I think you're one of the first youth ministers who actually became a seminarian in our diocese, that you know firsthand working in that vineyard, in that role as a volunteer, as an employee of the struggles that young people, that you went through, that you're going through, and that they'll face along the way. So I'm just so amazed. I'm just so amazed. So one of the questions that, that I have is, you know, this is the one I asked a long time ago to someone. It's like, who are the three people who have been the most influential to you? Living or dead? <laughs> Both. Okay. And you can't claim, you cannot claim a saint. <laughs> cannot claim Mother Teresa who was the most influential person in my life. Someone that has met you. Oh, okay, <laughs> it's okay, like, okay. okay. And not spiritually. It says, well, I've met her yeah, yeah. in prayer. No. Yeah. So three most people closest to you who are most influential in your okay. life. I think um, first and foremost um, is my former youth minister who, you know, raised me in ministry. And, and that's uh, Debbie Rivera. Um, I, 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 can I pause there, Debbie yeah. Rivera? I, I just have to say that the whole thing when I say be blessed, and the whole thing when I say be third, you know, just out of confessing, you know, I'm gonna be, I stole be third from her. <laughs> Literally, be third came from Miss Rivera. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it did not come from me. So, uh, you just going totally honest, the, you know, Jesus first, other second, you third was her creation the whole joy thing be third oh so, yes there you go oh yeah but yeah. she didn't trademark it so i stole it <laughs> you know she, if she was here right now she'd probably tell you that you know good <laughs> spread it spread it more <laughs> right yeah so go on oh yeah so there so, we are why um you know she has been you know like a second mother to me um and especially you know in raising me in ministry and and just taking me to a whole level of 
a, a new level of discipleship and what it means to be a practicing Catholic, not just as a teen or as a young adult, but in, in your whole life, you know, I just, you know, I, I'm just so thankful and grateful for everything. And, and it, it's just crazy. And, and, you know, me and Debbie, we look back on, you know, how much of a troublemaker core leader I used to be, or even as a participant, I used to be. And now we look back and be like, wow, like, <laughs> here you are. And, you know, and, you know, shoot, I was her successor in, in ministry at St. Francis. So, um, you know, just the way that whole transition happened. And now, you know, her seeing the fruits because, you know, I'm, I'm one of her fruits and, um, you know, and it's, you know, and she, again, she, she, if she's watching this or if she was here right now, she'd probably say, no, it's, it's all glory to God. And yes, it is all glory yes. to God, but Amen. it's, it's the way that God worked through you to minister to me to um, the other core members that are my brothers and sisters too, that we're raised in ministry together. It's because the way that God used you as an instrument is the reason why I've gotten this far as, as a Catholic. And, you know, that's one very influential person. And, um, you know, I'm just forever grateful for, for Debbie. Another one, um, you know, is uh, my, well, can I combine two? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Well, actually three. Well, just like my, you know, some of my closest friends, you know, like uh, Santiago, Magana, uh, Maritza Lojero, and, and, you know, Rianne and Celaya, um, like they've, I mean, we've been in ministry for many years now, and like they have just, uh, we just had this community within us, and just this desire for sainthood. And we've been on this journey together. We've seen each other at our worst and our, and our best. And it's just that, 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 Familyness that we have in each other mm -hmm. and we inspire and we influence each other you know and even back then when we didn't know what we were doing you know like if we if this was a sin or if you know if we had a question about like the faith or something like we'd all get together we kind of like you know discuss it and you know so we've been there for each other in that way and um you know the third person um who i would say has been really influential you said no saints right no saints oh, well no <laughs> no um <laughs> We're all saints. Yes. <laughs> but no capital S saints. Oh, gosh. Okay. Um, uh, I guess, you know, I, I think and recently, you know, within the past few years, another person who's been influential in my life has been my pastor, Father James. Um, you know, I'm very thankful that he is my shepherd at our parish of St. Francis. And I'm very thankful for the blessings of him giving me the privilege to, you know, be a youth minister. But more so, I, he's an influence to me because the way that he fulfills his priestly ministry. And um, I just, you know, seeing the way that he, um, you know, is so particular about the liturgy and the reverence that he has for the Novus, or the Novus Ordo Mass and also just for, you know, like different liturgical thing celebrations and, mm -hmm. and the way that he handles situations and the way that he um, meets people where they're at. You know, so I've seen some priests, um, you know, before, like, you know, they, if somebody goes up to them after mass and they just say, oh, not right now, make an appointment, you know, and, and you know, I'm just like, oh, okay. Um, but, you know, Father James, I've seen so many times, again, witnessing firsthand and just seeing that humility in the priest, his priestly ministry and seeing him turn around and just say, okay, let's, let's go over here and talk. And, you know, I've seen so many, like, tears that happen in that moment because maybe that person is dealing with something and they just need that tenderness of a father in that moment and for me that's just been such an influence especially on this past year especially with you know COVID and the many hard decisions that he's had to make this past year and it's opened my eyes that wow like you know him being you know um, a little bit older you know as a priest that he is you know he still commits himself daily he doesn't he doesn't he doesn't relent he doesn't hold back Mm -hmm. And I think for me, that's been something that's been influential and, and that shows me what type of priest I want to be, that selfless, sacrificial priest that's there for your, your community. And well, so, yeah. You know, that's, that's beautiful. Uh, you know, I, I, I love the fact that you, you, you shared an image of a loving and, and humble Jesus mm -hmm. in your priest and, and not the snarky Jesus mm -hmm. that sometimes we see in, in some priests. Yeah. We, who has their place mm -hmm. at specific times, mm -hmm. but um, to see an, uh, someone witness holiness, mm -hmm. um, I just think that brings out more vocation yeah. because 
I think a lot of young people see that and say, just like, as you said, priests are like superheroes. I want to be like them. Mm -hmm. I want to be like that. Mm -hmm. I want to be like that guy. Yeah. I want to be as holy as that man. Mm -hmm. And, and when, when you witness holiness, mm -hmm. it's attractive. Mm -hmm. It's attractive. And, and that's what superheroes are. Yeah. That's what superheroes are. You want to be Superman. Mm -hmm. You want to be the Batman. You want to be that guy that saves lives. That's selfless. Yeah. That's sacrificial. so su sacrificial, selfless. It's like, it's Jesus. Not for the statues, not, not, for, not for anything else. Not for the echo. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but for the for the selfless acts that they give and that's what's the beauty of it is yeah hey man and then your three friends yeah that, that just brought you closer mm -hmm. there's nothing better i think than seeing young people walking with each other and as stumbling you said stumbling together stumbling together exactly <laughs> what you said you guys were trying to figure out is this a sin yeah <laughs> i like, mean even to this day like oh i did this oh is that a sin? Let's look it up. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, then we'll calling each other it. out, right? Yeah. And lovingly, lovingly. Exactly. telling each other, yeah, that's a sin too. Yeah. And let me take you to confession. Yeah. It's so like, we'll, let me, we'll yeah. drive together. Yeah. No like, I, I have a priest on my speed dial, <laughs> but we'll go right now. Yeah. You know, never know. You could die any minute. I don't want you to go to hell. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and obviously, and you know, privilege of working at parish, I have a priest phone number. So right. they, if they ever need a confession, oh, Father. You know, can you do you have time right now he's like oh yeah sure meet me at the church so yeah. that's a blessing <laughs> and you're like by the way i brought some extra yeah <laughs> and oh, you get yeah. that look it's like well okay fine uh, this time <laughs> yeah. it's like that that also is the advantage of of knowing someone who knows priests that um that yeah we abuse that <laughs> and if you do folks if you are listening to this and you have phone numbers of priests in your speed dial don't abuse them they do have lives. Personal lives. You know, you, they do have personal lives that, you know, it's not like, uh, you know, what we envision that priests are sitting by their phones waiting for a phone call to minister to you. They're available, but they do have personal lives and we need to respect that. You know, mm -hmm. when their day's off, yes. it's their day off. Yes. You know, most people don't know this, but our holy priests get one day off a week, one day. When the world is talking about, hey, we're going to a 32-hour work week mm -hmm. so that you can have three days off, our priests still have only one day off. Mm -hmm. And on that day off, guess what? When we yeah, find them at the grocery store, oh. we still ask them questions. Ask them questions. So <laughs> actually don't have yeah. a day off. Yeah. So that's that's just so amazing. Um, so you you, I want to go back to what you said in the Novus Ordo and your priest and had such reverence mm -hmm. and that attracted you. And we just recently, we just spoke in episode 99 about um, the multiproprio um, that Pope uh, Francis shared. And there was such an uproar with that mm -hmm. because it, if people felt that there was a limitation that was being placed on the traditional Latin mass, which, you know, in the wisdom of, of Bishop Rojas, nothing much changed in the diocese except for our holy priest asking for permission. Mm -hmm. And what I saw in that is that... A lot of young people, a lot of people, and they're very young mm -hmm. that you see in the Novus Ordo. It's, it's people saying it's like old people. Whenever I go, it's really young families. Mm -hmm. right? It's like they're in their 30s. Oh, yeah. It's very rare you see like old, old people mm -hmm. in there. It's really young families, and we wonder why. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times people say they're attracted to the reverence. Yes. But what's also interesting is that they are not, and some are, mm -hmm. um, strictly um, TLM. Mm -hmm. But some aren't. They go to both. It's not either or, it's both mm -hmm. and. And so I, I just want to hear from you what your take is on why you feel so many young Catholics of your age are attracted to the TLM. Mm -hmm. I think um, the TLM is a very beautiful place how, where you can experience Jesus, you know, and just focus on that and, and, I mean, at both the, the NO and the TLM, you obviously you focus on Jesus anyway. But I think the TLM is a little bit more intimate and it, and it shows more beauty in, in that sense. And that's not to say that the Novus Ordo, Novus Ordo isn't, you know, um, isn't beautiful either because they're both, you know, beautiful in their own ways. And I think, um, you know, definitely, you know, a lot of people desire to go to the TLM 
versus an mm-hmm. NO or, or they're both, which is completely fine. There's no, it's, it's not right to say that one is better than the other. No. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I think, you know, I think it's just maybe that desire to have an intimate, more intimate relationship. Mm-hmm. Maybe they're, they're seeking more intimate because maybe, and who knows, maybe they've had a bad experience at the NO before. Yeah. And that's why they choose to go to the TLM, which is, you know, you know, we, you know, that's so true. We hope that that would never happen, but you know, I'm pretty sure we've all been to maybe a mass that was just kind of like awkward, uh, questionable. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I, I think also too is that there's a constancy. There's a there's a constancy um, in the TLM that you go and it is what you expect it to be. And sometimes yeah. when we go to the Novus Ordo, it depends on the priest. Oh, definitely. And and, and the priest sometimes is like, well. That's weird. Yeah, uh, that's not what happens at the Novus Ordo Mass that I yeah. go to in my parish, and I, oh, I yeah. get invited to this one. It's like, when did that change, yeah. or when did they start doing that, or when did they allow that? And then you go to a different parish, um, and it's different. Mm-hmm. You know, recently my wife and I have been going to the vigil masses at different parishes, mm-hmm. and that's not because we're exploring. We're not trying to those listeners who are part of my parish. We're not leaving the church, and we're not leaving our parish. We're just going about and exploring and, and seeing how other parishes worship in the Novus Ordo and the TLM. Um, and, and it is, it's, there are slight differences in each community. Mm-hmm. And it's beautiful. Oh, very. It's, it's very beautiful because it's that community. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what the, the understanding of that is, is. That's that community. Mm-hmm. And as long as, and you know, my friends who are uh, TLM, who are very traditional listeners, might be shocked when I, if I say this. But for me, as long as you're following the general instruction of the Roman Missal and doing things that way, and a reverent, then I believe that's good mass. That's illicit and valid mass. Now where I go forth and say, you know, it was a priest going up there wearing bunny ears <laughs> and, and hopping around and, yeah. and, passing, and out candy to kids. passing out candy to kids. <laughs> and and you're, you're not, you know, you're not the Pied Piper mm-hmm. and making it a show yeah. instead of a worship mass. That's always where I cringe and mm-hmm. I, I'm almost tempted to, you know, that's when I'm like, oh, I, I'm going, I can't, I can't, yeah. I can't because it, it's, it's, it's really hard mm-hmm. um, when you see, sometimes you feel like this is a desecration of the Lord. Um, so uh, my question to you is, as going to the seminary, obviously, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, um, as Father Mike Schmidt says, you're a pit, a PIT, he's a pit, priest in training. Mm-hmm. Um, I love that topic. He's, yeah. You know, when his mom calls him a pit, uh, a priest in training. When you become a priest, I mean, you're going to have your own parish. Obviously, you're going to be an associate first, and then you're going to have your own parish, and you're going to be leading a flock. Now, our priests are assigned six years mm-hmm. instead of long periods where before, I remember I had a parish priest that was there my entire life until I moved away. And he was still the parish priest. And now it's six years. Mm-hmm. So how do you feel about having to move every six years now? Mm-hmm. Or, God forbid, the bishop says, I'm going to extend you another six years. Yeah. You're there for 12. Mm-hmm. But you have to leave. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's kind of like every time, it's kind of like you're, you're being moved all of a sudden having to start over. Yeah. So how do you feel about that, that that's what you're going to be doing? Mm-hmm. I think that's, um, you know, it. I really haven't really thought much into it other than, you know, that if, you know, that it's on, I'm, I consider myself pretty flexible, you know, and, you know, getting things done in a short amount of time. And I don't, not saying that, you know, when I become a priest, God willing, like I'm going to go into parishes and change everything the way that Chris <laughs> wants to be, because it's not about me, <laughs> but like, you know, some priests do it. Yeah, it's true. But you know, that's not the way I, um, you know, I am, but when I say get things done is, you know, how do we advance the church in Mm -hmm. that certain time, depending on whatever, wherever we're at, I don't know where the whole church, the capital C church will be in, you know, eight years from now, you know, 
um, and what the issues are and what needs to be addressed, where the community needs need to be met, if they weren't met before, you know, how to prepare that parish. But, um, you know, it doesn't really bother me or, you know, I mean, you know, that's just the way it is. And who knows, maybe even that six years will change. Yeah. Maybe it'll be longer or maybe it'll be less. Who, yeah. who knows? So, yeah. So, yeah. 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 And, and the reason why I asked that, the six years, I think that's, that that was the 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 church's answer to the sexual abuse crisis that was happening in in, in the world okay. and so um knowing that every single time as a catholic that's what everyone always points out how can you remain in the church that your priests who are supposed to be holy are the ones abusing the most vulnerable and we've had in our diocese uh, cases where you know, priest marry the lady, uh, there's been abuse, and that's true. You know, full disclosure here, it happens. But it happens in other communities and other faith communities, which is not an excuse mm -hmm. for what happens. Mm -hmm. So knowing that, and knowing that's, that's what you're going into, mm -hmm. and knowing that that still might happen, or that might still be happening why did you still want to be a priest? Because mm -hmm. you're going to be looked at wearing your collar. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be judged. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, there's that perfect priest. Mm -hmm. um, why do you still want to go through that? Yeah. Um, when the first year I became a youth minister, I actually went to a, a training, a life team training. It's called Empower. And they did it in Laguna Niguel. And um, I think I was there. Really? <laughs> Maybe, yeah. That was the old guy. Oh. <laughs> and um, and it was just right when all the sexual abuse scandals were coming out into light. Um, the most recent ones, and then that's right shortly after that, the diocese, our diocese, and other South Southern California diocese, and well, all the dioceses in California really were releasing the list of you know to be transparent with the communities. And I remember the the speaker at the time for the for the event at the very end he talked about that and what realities we may face you know youth families leaving the church because of that you know um and so I, i'll never forget this and i think this is what really helped me on my discernment process to discern whether or not god was truly calling me to the priesthood and in a way it kind of made me more conscious of is god calling me is that he said he said this he said um there's, there's only three reasons why a priest becomes a priest. They either become a priest for themselves, for God, or for the devil. And I remember a front row, I was sitting, and again, with my other core members too, and I was just like, oh. And thinking about that now, and it's true, you know, a lot of priests, you know, they become personality, you know, priests, mm -hmm. and it's just me, 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 me. A lot of priests, they infiltrate the church because they're called by the devil. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately we have the priests who are called because they responded to God's call for them, you know? And I think that's something that's really affected my discernment. And I think I try to make excuses like, oh no, like, like God isn't calling me. Like, you know, like this isn't, I don't want to, I don't want to do this. And, you know, but it's again, after these past few years of just struggling, and seeking spiritual direction and, and just, you know, if just finally saying yes, because I do know that God is calling me to this and that's, what's really helped me. And, and so, you know, um, you know, we do have priests that, you know, have fallen and, you know, they do, they are good priests and, you know, that we hear good things about, but then we hear of the things that they've done and fallen and it's just, well, you know, we just pray for them and we just pray for the people that have been affected and everything. But going back to your question of, of how do I feel about being judged and all this stuff? And, you know, I see, you know, I, I it really doesn't bother me, you know, let, let people judge. And, you know, I hope they would create conversation with, you know, non-believers or maybe people mm -hmm. who have that negative connotation for the priests, you know, priests in general or bishops or, or whatnot, because, um, you know, I think those conversations need to be had if they've been harmed or why do they have that? Because a lot of times if people think that way, they don't know the whole truth yeah. or they don't know that, you know, that this is, it's not just the priesthood where, where these 
bad things happen. It's in every profession. Yeah. We all, we, the most common of all is, you know, we know the good teachers and we know the bad teachers that right. we had in school. The same thing with priests, you know, unfortunately there are some good priests and then there's some priests that make us question and, you know, yeah. Yeah, amazing. I love that answer. Mm -hmm. Called by God, they're in it for themselves mm -hmm. or they're called by the devil. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I missed that class. <laughs> Wish I would have taken that one. <laughs> but are you looking forward to wearing Roman, you know, your clerics? Yeah. So I mean, I, I'm excited. You know, I'm yeah. I'm yeah. the only times I wear those is during Halloween. <laughs> I dress up like St. John Bosco. Yeah. Uh, at work, mm -hmm. and actually, people say, "Hey, can I go to confession?" Yes. I'm like, "It's Halloween." Yeah. But you get to wear your superhero outfit mm -hmm. every day mm -hmm. for the rest of your life mm -hmm. once you become one of our priests, mm -hmm. clerics. Mm -hmm. And and for me, I just want to ask, are you going to be one of those priests that walks around wearing like, you know, the Hawaiian shirts and, you know, oh, shorts and flip flops <laughs> and, and walking around? Are you going to be one, you know, around, you know, the church grounds and you're like, who is that guy? Yeah. It's like, oh, he's our priest. Yeah. Or are you going to be the guy who's wearing clerics? It's like, oh yeah, he's yeah. our priest. Oh yeah, no, I, I personally, you know, I know some priests are, are different and have different opinions but like for me personally you know i think it's very important that you wear your clerics you know and it, even you know when you're out in public too you know it's i think it's such a beautiful witness you know um you know a few months ago i was flying on a plane to go visit an aunt in mississippi and there was actually a bishop on my plane and so i talked to him and but i wouldn't have known he's a bishop yeah. if he wasn't wearing his clerics right you know yeah. and we had a really good conversation and and it was it was it was great um but um yeah so i think you know wear them as much as you can unless you go to the beach i don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah and we, we give you permission there it's, it's always awkward though when i see my face at the beach wearing shorts and you know it's like yeah you have legs, you have legs. <laughs> it's it's kind of like growing up you know yeah. i always thought that nuns floated it's like they didn't have feet yeah yeah it's like and now nuns wear pants and yeah. regular clothes and it's like yeah. oh it's okay too but I, I'm, I'm glad you said that because doing traveling mm -hmm. and you do see, you know, a Catholic priest, it is very much calming for me mm -hmm. to see, oh, wow, I'm, I'm flying with a priest. Yeah. So like in case this plane drops, I can go to that guy and say, hey, can you give me like absolution know, exactly. real quick? It's like, can you like <laughs> just give a general absolution to this entire plane? Yes, yes. <laughs> That's just how my mind works. Yeah. I'm sorry, Tony. <laughs> I, I shouldn't have said that. But um, but yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. Because I, I really think I, I love the fact that you're going in. You're 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 a minister, you're a youth minister, you've had that experience, you've been doing the work, and now you're going to seminary mm -hmm. to gain more formation and to you know, follow your breviary and and amazing. I'm just so excited for you. Mm -hmm. Um you know, one of the things, what's your advice, you know, to other young people who may be called, but are, are like bucking it and just like, mm -hmm. no, I, I, I don't want to. Mm -hmm. What would you say to them who, who may feel called, but truly are afraid mm -hmm. to say yes? I think, um, I think realizing that if you first of all have the desire in your heart and you just even have the slightest slightest inclination or thought that you may be called to religious life specifically priesthood um i think that's worth taking a step on you know taking that that step forward and that doesn't mean that when you call the vocations office that they're gonna put you down and spam you with calls or you know um you know just you know get on you about applying um because you know like in our diocese for example you know father Howe was was just amazing at accompaniment and you know i'm very thankful for him accompanying especially during COVID. you know it was it was, it was difficult at times you know discerning and you know finding a spiritual director too but i think you know if you have the slightest inclination of of the desire to become a priest only the best outcome come, can come out of it, which is you being accepted to seminary and you applying and ultimately uh, becoming a priest after your formation process. And like for myself, like this, this 
me applying and being here and, and even in this whole process of me uh, being a volunteer minister and now applying and now entering as a seminarian, this wasn't inevitable. This was not something that was just going to happen because somebody snapped their fingers or, you know, a dove crashed through a window and, you know, it gave me holy insight. No, I mean, it, it's, it's not never going to be inevitable because it's, it, a thousand things had to go right and a thousand things had to go wrong in order for me to get to where I'm at. And everybody's story is different. Everybody has their own path to their vocation. And if maybe your path is towards uh, priesthood, then just take that first step and, you know, talk to, you know, your, somebody that you trust, you know, specifically, you know, a priest or, um, you know, the vocations director, but, you know, you just have to take that first step and you have to, um, at least act on it or else it's going to eat you alive and it's just going to be you're going to be bombarded with that what ifs and then what if it gets too late in life where you're just like oh well what if I would have said yes or you know and don't you shouldn't do that to yourself you should at least give it a chance and if it doesn't work out then it doesn't work out and you just continue discerning whatever else God has planned for you because again what's the best what's the best or worst that could happen you know and so yeah. you could become a holy priest exactly or, the best. you know, for you ladies, a holy religious. Exactly. Yeah. But discernment is being able to say yes. Yes. And being open. And surrendering. And surrendering. Good word. Surrendering to that. Um, and thank you for your surrender. Thank you. It wasn't easy. But, and again, all my friends and family know that too, that it's very difficult. I've been fighting this for years, but, you know, it's through the surrender and just my constant yes that. So what do you have to say to your family and friends? <laughs> um, you know, thank you guys for uh, accompanying me and, you know, just being there for me and, and just supporting me because, you know, and you guys know that I don't say it enough and, you know, that, but just thank you guys. And I'm just thankful and grateful for you all. And yeah. And that is the story of <laughs> vocations. That is a story of this seminarian who's, by the way, if you want to reach him, I'm going to put out his Instagram. It is no longer Catholic Youth Minister Chris underscore Chris. It is now a seminarian underscore Chris, which I had such a hard time finding him because I'm like, where did he go? Well, I made my Instagram for ministry, you know, at in a few years ago when I became a minister. And I didn't know what to make my name. So I just put, oh, CYM underscore Chris. And, I, and when I, you know, I'm no longer a youth minister now, so... I'm just like, oh, well, I guess seminary and underscore Chris works. So, yeah. yeah. And so when you're trying to find CYM underscore Chris and it's not populating, I'm like, okay, he dissed me. <laughs> I blocked you. No, I'm just kidding. She, he literally blocked me. I was like, he doesn't want to come on the podcast. And then I, 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 I looked up, you know, it's like, what is his last name? And then I typed it in. I'm like, he changed it to seminary underscore Chris like, without any notice. But amazing amazing story thank you to your family and your friends for really accompanying you along with your spiritual advisor holy mm -hmm. priest and all those people who have guided you to be able to say yes i, I can't stress enough that it's not one person mm -hmm. who says yes who allows a person to be able to say to surrender themselves to the vocation mm -hmm. of a priesthood it takes the family Mm -hmm. and the family of friends and community mm -hmm. uh, to be able to allow you to do that it takes a village it takes a village and thank you for allowing them to be a part of you because i wholeheartedly believe that when you take your vows they get to appreciate that and they just like just like saint Teresa of lasso they get to receive the graces mm -hmm. bestowed on you for your holiness mm -hmm. and it reflects also on them yes so good for them lucky lucky you i was like and lucky you i mean not lucky but blessed such blessings are bestowed on you and so many prayers on all our listeners make sure that you pray for all our seminarians especially chris rodriguez right here who's going in august 26 <laughs> a beautiful seminary in san Bernardino. Uh, i can't stress enough look in our bio to check out the seminary and vocational um program for the diocese of san Bernardino. that's sb diocese sb vocations uh, for the diocese of san Bernardino. i think i'm screwing that up but yeah yeah s 
San Bernardino Vocations. 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 Yeah. yeah, SB Vocations. It's in our link. It's in our bio. So just check it out. <laughs> Father Howe is great. Um, the rest of the seminarians there also are great. You're going to be with a bunch of great people. Mm -hmm. That's like Exciting. literally my <laughs> image of, of you guys on the boat right there in the, <laughs> in the painting of a chaotic boat with Jesus <laughs> sleeping on a pillow. That's literally going to be you guys. I literally have a face for each one of the disciples <laughs> in that boat. So when I do my painting and, and put you in there, I'm going to find out that, which disciple are you? And you're going to be disciple Chris. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, it's going to be amazing. So on that note, I can talk forever. As you guys know, I can talk forever. But we want to make sure we want to honor your time as um, youth minister Sarah always used to tell me you need to honor people's time it's like well no it's, like, it's my show <laughs> but anyways thank you chris for coming on thank you arnel for having me and you know i'm very blessed for being here and sharing about my vocation hopefully you know it provides some insight for maybe you're discerning or maybe you know people who are discerning in your own life or um and so yeah so thank you for having me awesome <laughs> awesome and as usual as we close we want to always pray for those people who are discerning vocation, especially already those who are in the vocation of priesthood. I implore you to keep our priest in prayer because as people who are in persona Christi in their call, the devil attacks them the most. Mm -hmm. And if you know, if you've been attacked, you know how hard that is. And our priests are the ones who are tempted the most. Mm -hmm. So constant prayers for our priests, our seminarians and those serving in in ministry that's really important um, to increase vocations as we said in the past um, uh, podcast talk to people be invitational ask them have you considered you know let me and walk with them and pray for them mm -hmm. because what we need most in our church today are more holy priests mm -hmm. and and that's what's going to change the tide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what's going to change the tide. Mm -hmm. So again, thank you for your yes. Thank you, Anna. Right? Thank you. <laughs> and so that's all we have for all you all this time around, folks. Make sure to listen for the other shows and other podcasts. I hope you all tuned in to our next episode on this connected, which I think what we're going to reveal is we're going to do DTR episodes. So we're going to talk about relationships. So we move from vocations to the vocation of marriage. And so we're moving on from vocation to the uh, orders and priesthood to actual marriage. So that's yeah. going to be interesting. So look forward to those episodes. Um, as usual, if you like this podcast, please send us a review. Uh, click like on any of those things. Tony's going to hate me because I'm already screwing this part up. But anyways, send us a comment, send us an email at catholic.dad50 at gmail.com or send me a DM at, on our Instagram at catholic.dad and make sure you rate this podcast. And if you're feeling called by the Holy Spirit to be generous and become a patron on our, to our show to help support the podcast, you can go on to our patreon.com forward slash disconnected and be a patron. We have some really cool gifts for our patrons there. And it actually helps us to continue our mission to have people live a life of holiness and, and share the faith. And actually all our funds goes to supporting other ministries who, who may be in need. So please consider being a patron to our, our, um, our podcast here. And you can go to our bio to do that. So again, as usual, Remember, live a life of holiness. We'll be praying for you. Please pray for us. And most importantly, be blessed. And Debbie, be third. Different points of view and highs and lows. A new perspective everywhere you go. Open up your mind and drown with the noise. Different generations of the girls and boys. So sit back and relax. This cat, the podcast, don't overreact. If the thoughts are abstract when it's hosted by Catholic Doc Dad, who knows what's gonna happen? Hey, what's up, fam? Different points of view and highs and lows. A new perspective everywhere you go. Open up your mind and drown with the noise. And see if this connected. What's up, man? To connect.
generations and situations about faith, life, and whatever Spec runaway thoughts like a runaway train break into conversation like links of a chain make a hail mary pass hope disconnects have a question for a guest put it to rest live a life of holiness lead by example follow at catholic dot dead and many tangled <laughs> christ leads our way he's the good shepherd pray for one another be blessed and be there different points of view and highs and lows a new perspective everywhere you go open up your mind and drown with the noise and see if this connected Amen. <laughs> so that's all bye folks thank you and that's all she wrote <laughs>